Hello, I'm Mark Forsyth and welcome to lesson number 11 on how to write English verse. Uh, today we're going to do approximately the same thing as last time, which is just go through a very short poem and work out how the meter in it works. Uh, last time was a little bit long, I know this time it will just be an eight line poem, namely The Wombat by Ogden Nash, which I love because I just love saying the word wombat. And the, the whole poem goes, I can try it very quickly. The wombat lives across the seas, among the far antipodes. He may exist on nuts and berries, or then again on missionaries. His distant habitat precludes conclusive knowledge of his moods, but I would not engage the wombat in any form of mortal combat. Now, what we're going to do is go through that and find out why it sounds so pleasantly rhythmical and so neat. And that's all we're going to be doing is understanding uh, how it it comes that we say it so naturally with such a lovely rhythm. So, there are stresses in English. Some words are stressed more than others, quite naturally, and also you stress some syllables of some words more than others, quite naturally. For example, you say wombat, and you don't say wombat. Uh, if you were shouting the word across the street, or if you were angrily saying the word wombat, then you would say wombat with all of the stress on the first syllable, rather than saying wombat, which would sound simply wrong to a native English speaker. And the way we notate that is to um, put a little X above the wom and a dash above the bat to show that the wom is stressed and the bat is unstressed. Also, we tend not to stress little unimportant words like articles and prepositions and conjunctions and things like that, especially when they come right next to an important word like a noun. So the wombat, we wouldn't put stress on the wombat, we'd say the wombat, and that stress falls on the warmer, so it's the wombat. Uh, but verbs, a verb tends to be stressed because it's important. Again, so lives there gets a stress and we go, the wombat lives, and you get a rhythm forming already. The wombat lives. And then the word across, Again, you can try it both ways. You can say across, or you can say across. And across sounds way more sensible than across, which sounds uh, like a strange sport or something. Uh, so across is stressed on that second syllable, across. And then again, the same rules apply here, that the article is going to be unstressed because it's just a little article, the, and sees is a noun, so it gets the stress. And the result is, when you say that line quite naturally, you will say it as, the wombat lives across the seas. Because this is what a poet does. They arrange the words in such a way that they form a natural rhythm. Now this second line here, we have the same thing starts to apply. You say, is it among, with the stress on the second syllable, among, or is it among? And it's certainly not um, among, because that sounds all wrong in English. So you go, it's among, and then we have, uh, the, obviously there is the rather strange word here which you may or may not be familiar with, which is antipodes. Um, that is pronounced antipodes, I promise you. Odd, there's an odd etymological reason that it's not pronounced antipodes, but uh, it is pronounced antipodes, so it's pronounced with the antipodes, and that's the way you say it, antipodes. So, we go antip or these, like that. And here, the, unstressed, because it's just the, and you very rarely stress the, and far is an adjective which happens to be sitting um, far away from any stresses. And we don't li ever like in English to have too many unstressed syllables going on and on and on, because you need to stress something. So um, far, because it's between two unstressed syllables mainly, gets a stress. And so, quite naturally, you'd say these two lines as the wombat lives across the seas among the far antipodes. Among the far antipodes. And you'll notice here that we have exactly the same stress pattern in the first line and in the second line. It goes da dum, 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 da dum. Four da dums in a row for both lines. The technical name for that is iambic tetrameter, but you don't need to remember any te technical names. You just need to see that there's a rhythm there, a regular rhythm, and it's the same pattern in both lines. Now here we again <coughs> have, um, he may exist on nuts and berries, 
or then again on missionaries. Now, uh, exist there is either exist or exist. And exist is the one that sounds right with the stress on the second syllable. He may, uh, again, he's just a, a pronoun, whereas may is a verb, so may takes the stress over he, so uh, he is unstressed and may is stressed. Uh, little preposition, we're not going to stress on there, but we will stress the noun nuts, because we like saying nuts almost as much as we like saying wombat. Conjunction, unstressed, and then berries. So is it berries or is it berries? And the answer is it's berries. So we get stress and unstressed. Da dum da dum da dum da dum da. Uh, the second line here, fourth line of the whole poem. Or then again on missionaries. Now missionaries we can work out is it's not missionaries, it's missionaries. And you could try it any particular way because there are four syllables, but missionaries. Tum, t, tum, t. Again is again. It's not again, which just sounds very wrong, it's again. So we will go to tum. Or then, actually you could have stressed this either way, but as there's this rhythm already going in your head and we have four lines in now, you're much more likely to stress then than all. You'll stress one of those two words because they all then again on missionaries, but by the time the rhythm has got going like this, you're much more likely to say or then again on missionaries because uh, English verse has momentum to it once you've started hearing the way it's pronounced. Again, you will see that these two lines are identical in their stress pattern. Da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da. In this case, they both have an extra unstressed syllable on the end of the line, which the last, the first two lines of the poem didn't have. But that doesn't change that basic rhythm. Um, it's a variant. It, feels roughly the same and we still have the four stressed syllables in each line and we still have that alternation, the very regular alternation between soft, stressed, soft, stressed, soft, stressed and so on. Lines five and six here. Uh, the word distant, is it distant or is it distant? And the answer is distant, I hope. Uh, with the stress on the first syllable, you're really overemphasizing a distant, not distant. So, distant. His, just a possessive, unstressed. Habitat, or is it habitat? 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 Habitat. Habitat sounds good. Tum to tum. Stress, soft, stress. Habitat, rather than habitat, which would be da dum da. Habitat which sounds all wrong. So we go habitat. And then precludes has the stress there on the, the second syllable. You don't say precludes uh, because that sounds wrong. It's precludes. So we have the da dum da dum da dum da dum that we had in the uh, first and second line. Again, we're going to go um, conclusive. How does that go? Conclusive or conclusive? Yeah, stress on the middle syllable there. Knowledge or knowledge? Knowledge. Stress on the first. Of his moods. Now, moods is definitely going to be stressed. His won't be because it's just a possessive next to a stressed syllable. Um, of. Now, of wouldn't normally be stressed, but on that rule that if it's a lonely syllable in the middle between other unstressed syllables, then you'll probably put some stress on it. Um, so that gets to be of. Conclusive knowledge of his moods. Again, we have both lines identical stress patterns, four stresses each time, and alternating soft, stressed, soft, stressed, soft, stressed. His distant habitat precludes conclusive knowledge of his moods. And finally, but I would not engage the wombat. Now, wombat, we've already seen, has a stress on the first syllable there. The, unimportant. Uh, engage or engage. 
end gauge sounds like something in an aeroplane or something, a gauge to measure ends. But engage, stress on the second syllable. And, but I would not. So I is going to be stressed over but and would and not there by the same system of being a lonely uh, syllable between two other stress syllables gets a stress. But I would not engage the wombat. And here we have any has to be stressed on the first syllable rather than any, any, any. Uh, in will be unstressed because it's uh, an important word and form there as a noun gets a nice stress of unimportant, no stress, mortal or mortal. Mortal is stress on the first. And then combat. Is it combat or combat? Uh, it would, by the way, if it were a verb, be combat, as in combating the uh, whatever it is you happen to be fighting, but or combating. <laughs> but in this case, combat uh, is stressed on the first syllable, which is why, by the way, it rhymes with wombat, because the rhyme always goes from the last stress and has to be all of the syllables following that rhyming away. And again, we see this regular pattern, this alternation of soft, stressed, soft, stressed, soft, stressed, soft, stressed, soft, and both lines being the same, and four stressed syllables in each line. But I would not engage the wombat in any form of mortal combat. And what that means is that if we look at the whole thing, I'm, I'm moving in here a bit, we can see it's got an absolutely regular pattern throughout. That's the underlying reason why that verse sounds so nice and rhythmic and so pleasant to recite, is because though it may sound all witty and whimsical and just off the cuff from Ogden Nash, it has this incredibly regular, disciplined structure working underneath. The wombat lives across the seas among the far antipodes. He may exist on nuts and berries, or then again on missionaries. His distant habitat precludes conclusive knowledge of his moods, but I would not engage the wombat in any form of mortal combat. You see, all of those lines fall into the same rhythm, and we can also see that if that rhythm keeps going even if you add an unstressed syllable to the end of some of the lines, because unstressed syllables at the end of the lines don't, um, don't really matter much. Uh, technically called a feminine ending, and technically this whole thing is called iambic tetrameter, but you do not need to remember that. All you need to do is see that there's this rhythm, and that rhythm has been forced upon you, as it were, or subtly massaged upon you by uh, the brilliant Ogden Nash. Uh, that's it for today's lesson. Uh, obviously, homework. Find a poem, an old poem you love, and go through it like this, and try and see what the rhythm is, and what form it's been written and how the poet has therefore made you read it in a certain way and with a certain rhythm. And I shall be back soon with another lesson. Till then.